Mm. Right. The early bus communicator is one of our most successful products because it, um, it really quickly answers a very significant problem for our customers and it does it really quickly and really easily. So um, I just want to stop on this slide for a minute. That's the, what the communicator looks like. Um, but before we go on, I want to do a quick analogy of what an industrial protocol is. And that's, uh, I, I've been trying this out a few times and nobody's told me to stop doing it. So I'm going to have another go and see what you think of it. I've got two children, two sons. Um, one's a little bit older than the other and they both speak English. But one of them just doesn't know when to communicate. So if somebody is on the phone or if somebody's watching the telly or somebody's already in the middle of a conversation, he doesn't care. He'll just start talking. And he's still using English, which is what we use in the house, but it's not appropriate because we're already in the middle of a conversation. He just doesn't get that kind of way of communicating. Whereas the older one, still using the same language, but when and where he uses it is different. And that's basically what a protocol is as opposed to a language. And if you think about it, when we're out and about, when we're in restaurants or when we're at Burger King or if we're doing a presentation or all these different things we do with each other, we'll still use the same language, but we'll do it in slightly different ways. And that's what a protocol is. So machines do the same thing and they also have different reasons for having a protocol. So they might need to send information to another machine and it has to be right every time or they might send a whole load of information and it doesn't matter if only 90% is right. So because there are different ways of handling that and exchanging that information, there are different protocols. And that's why you get some that are really expensive and some that are really difficult, some that are really quick to, to do. So that's why you get different kinds of protocols for machines. There is also another reason, which is like a commercial one because manufacturers try to get you locked in, but, but the technical reason is because you're handling data in different ways and exchanging it in different ways. So hopefully that makes sense. And now I want you to imagine a factory, um, of which this could be a typical place that you visit all the time. And quite often there'll be some nice whizzy looking machines that are sort of brand new and they're all networked together and they're getting the benefits of a network. But around the edge of the room, there are often machines that can't talk network. They might be basic serial devices, like for instance, a barcode reader. Is this, um, we're moving on. I'm not clicking that by the way. Um, can we go back? Cool, I've just lost the screen there. There we go. So, um, so I, I just want you to imagine this for a minute because this is one of the situations that you're in quite a lot of the time. Um, I thought you were gonna click then. <laughs> um, so no, don't click, <laughs> stop it. Um, so um, a factory owner will often be presented with a problem where he's got some machines that he can't add to the network. Um, and like for instance, a barcode reader. And for all other purposes, it works perfectly well, but it doesn't output its uh, information into the network and that presents a problem for him. So he can buy a new machine, which will cost, obviously, uh, cost some money to do. It'll also, he'll have to make room for it. He'll have to wire it in. He'll have to train people up on it. Um, or he could try to find a way of getting that machine to talk to the network. And that is where the communicator comes in. So whenever you go to places, uh, factories and, and other sort of technical areas, you will often see a whole set of really super whizzy machines and round the edge will be sort of older looking machines or, I don't know, slightly more serial looking machines with kind of serial connectors on or stuff that looks like they're a little bit more standalone. And that is where the opportunity is for communicators. So uh, if we look at this first slide here, um, there's a PLC on a network. So that's what I mean by the whizzy, you know, shiny looking stuff. And this particular example is a profit bus one. And there's a little weigh way scale at the bottom. And all it does is just outputs basic serial. It doesn't talk profit bus. So there's a couple of different options you can use. I'm gonna see if I can click this. 
Uh, yeah, I think that was me. Um, you can put an option card on the PLC. Um, and that does work. And for some circumstances, it works really well. But the problem is, first of all, it can sometimes be really expensive, but it also requires a lot of programming. And so that will require some kind of specialist uh, technology. Is that me? Right. Another option is to directly connect it to the PLC. Um, and that works. And that's normally a bit quicker. But the problem with that is, it's only connected to the PLC itself. It's not actually on the network. And the whole principle of networking is that all the machines can talk to each other. All of them can share all of this basic information. And if it's only connected to the PLC, then it sort of defeats the purpose. So another option, drum roll please, is the communicator. And basically all it does is just takes the serial output from that way scale and converts it to Profibus so that it can sit on the network. And as far as the rest of the network is concerned, that way scale is on the network. They don't realize there's anything else in between. It just looks like it's on the network. So if we go back to that factory owner who's got um, a tried and tested barcode reader in the corner, all he has to do is add one of these devices for let's say about 400 quid, a few hours configuration at the most, probably in most cases, and suddenly he's got that machine up and running again. That's a lot, lot easier than the other options. And that is why we sell loads of these. So if I try this next one, is that clicking on? Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's just, um, just do another click there. Yeah, let's just carry on. Right, okay, so the thing about the communicators is that uh, there's one specific one for each of the, the applications. So at the bottom of these blue uh, communicators, you can see um, the, uh, the serial side that you would connect your, let's say, odd device to. And then on the front of the unit is the specific network that you're gonna connect to. So there's one individual communicator for each thing that you need. Um, and you can see down the bottom there, there's all the protocols that you can use. Um, so if we carry on to the next one, the types of machine that you can use this for um, are around the kind of serial devices. So Modbus RTU, can we just flip through so we can see all the, um, all the bullet points? Um, so RTU would be things like um, any 232485 or 422. Um, depending on the particular protocol, you can have up to 31 devices into one of these units. Um, you can do ever such a lot really quickly because it's kind of pre-configured. Um, and the way that you program it is through a, a sort of drop-down menu-based tool that's free to download from the website. So all of those sorts of devices, you can plug into one of these communicators. Um, if we go on to the next slide, there's also just other types of serial. So uh, one example we had that we've done for a while now is a, is a pump that has a basic uh, control on the top, a basic controller, and it just needs serial uh, commands to make it work. So you send it a Q7 and it'll, it'll do something or an R1, it'll do something. That's just basic ASCII text that you send it. That sort of device is also what you can use for these uh, communicators. Um, it also has, is this the DF1? Let's try the next slide. Yeah, so we've also got DF1. So that's a specific kind of uh, protocol that's used around Rockwell. Um, I don't know how old that is now. I don't know if we see that much anymore, but it does those. Um, and then, as well as all the serial stuff, if we go on to the next slide, we've also got CAN. So, Basically, that's up 50% of all these devices, actually. If you look on the website, you can see a photo of all of the different serial ones and then of all of the different canned ones. So not only can you communicate with serial devices, but you can get onto a CAN network as well. And that could be really, really useful, especially for people who have a little bit of CAN, but the majority of their network is something else. Now, the other thing I just want to 
point out is I've, I've given you an example of where a device will input its information into a network, but it will work the other way around as well. So an example of that, we've got a customer that has big uh, display uh, screens. So for travel, for stations, uh, for sporting events, and they require serial information into them, but they get it from a network. So you can go both ways with this. Um, so if we have a quick look at the um, at a picture of it again, uh, we were talking about earlier, there's uh, the, the serial or the can will go in here. Um, there's a, an RJ11 uh, configuration port. That's actually like a smaller ethernet. It's a bit like the telephone plug. And you do get the cable in the box. Um, the power is underneath as well. And then on the top is the specific network that you're connecting to. Um, and they range, they're about 400, 450, that sort of uh, amount of money. It does vary a little bit, but it's that sort of amount. And if you think about how much a customer would spend doing an alternative, this is like an easy win. It's such a good opportunity. So if we just have a quick uh, refresh of it, then in any kind of factory setting, any sort of technical area, there will be spanky new machines that are all, uh, I just probably said that slightly wrong, um, all networked together and working really well. Around the edge or in a funny corner, there'll be some machines that don't look like they quite fit. And that is an ideal opportunity for the communicator. Uh, I think that's it. Any questions? Right. <clears throat> that was great, Bill. Uh, I think Gary Hudson from Leeds, um, he's put his hand up. I'll unmute him, see if he has to say anything. Hi, Gary. It, it, was, I have, it was more the fact that it sounded like a robot speaking. It's, very, it's got a lot of interference on what Bill was saying. OK. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's like Norman Collier was on, on stage. But we guess right. what he was saying by listening to, by seeing the pictures and yeah, I mean, it is a good little product anyway, because I've seen it for ages and it is, it's a very good solution, but that was mainly to tell him it sounds a bit robotic. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, we've got a recording of it, um, or, uh, on the go. So what I'll do is I'll share the recording and see if, um, it sounds all right in the recording or is a bit robotic. Um, yeah. if it's, Fine, then we can share that and you can go through yeah. it again. Well, then, um, the interference is people hear it okay. It'd be, it'd be good to hear from other people because uh, otherwise we might get that throughout the whole thing. Okay, right. So, okay at my end, Bill. Okay, mm -hmm. a bit stuttery at mine, but um, not that bad. Okay. Um, uh, the sound was okay. Paul Colley says the sound was okay. So okay. the recording should be okay then. Right. right. Any other questions? Right. Thank you for the feedback. Um, Darren says the sound's okay for me too. So it might be just the internet connectivity issue somewhere, um, somewhat. Um, but yeah, the recording will be there. So everybody will be able to hear that um, in their own time um, as well. So if any questions about communicator, um if not then we'll carry on i suppose there isn't any more okay so there is nobody are oh, they easy to set up so stuart is asking um is communicator very simple and easy to configure bill if you can answer that yeah i mean it does depend where you start from um typically when you add it to a network that side of it is very simple mostly it's it's a drop down menu kind of setup in most cases when you're adding a device that depending how complicated that device is it might be more or less complicated um, but it's all a sort of windows based um, approach so you might say you might have a, a a folder called read and then a line that says you know just just a line of hex and but you know that that hex is what that machine requires so it, it does depend a little bit um, I mean uh, perhaps Stuart can answer that better because he set one up um, for Duropipe so <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah I mean it, it just because if um, if the client's using Modbus 
as the sub device, that's easy. There's a wizard. So you just need your Modbus manual. You go step by step through the wizard and it's very easy. Uh, where Bill's coming from is if it's an, an, an ASCII based device. So it's like a barcode reader that's just going to send a string. You have to, again, easy and difficult is a relative term, but you have to just set up a little, little um, routine that the tool provides for you that tells the communicator, OK, when you see a code, a start code, STX, for example, your message is arriving. Tell it how many bytes of data it's going to get. Tell it what it to expect at the end. So is it is it ETX or line feed carriage return? So it knows where the message finished and then where to map it to inside the communicator uh, so that the, the PLC that's going to be reading it can find it. So it's familiarity, really. Um, you know, once you've done one, it's quite easy to do the rest. Often the most difficult thing is the documentation for the device you're trying to connect, because if that's good, you're on to a winner. If that's poor, you could have a lot of work to do. OK, so while you're on, I'll ask you one more question, and that's can you support bespoke serial protocols? And that's Andy Gavril from Warrington. Uh, which, Warrington. which protocols was that? Um, it's saying any bespoke serial protocol. So if somebody has written their own serial stuff, can that be supported yes. by using it? Yes. One of the nice things about the way the communicator is set up, as long as you, as long as they tell you how they've written it, serial is pretty standard. So the codes might mean different things, but essentially it's hex numbers. So as long as you tell it what to expect and in what order, the communicator is perfectly happy. So there's another one in terms of how do you connect to the communicator for configuration? Is it done by a USB cable, which comes as part of the box in, in the box? Yeah, there's, um, it's, a, it's actually a funny shaped connector called an RJ11, which is like a smaller, a smaller looking Ethernet one, um, like the phones sometimes have. But the, that cable comes in the box. Um, and uh, and you plug it into your laptop. Uh, now I'm just trying to think. Do you need the serial adapter for that? You do. Yeah. You do on the current one. You need a serial adapter. Yeah. serial. Yeah. So you need a little adapter for it. But it plugs. Uh, so so it would be from your laptop USB to serial, and then the cable that comes with it into the device itself. And then the the actual tool is is just free download on from the website. I think I'm right in saying, Bill, aren't I? The new generation that's heading our way, that is native USB, I think, isn't it? No. Is it, it, how is it, I'm not sure how that's configured on that one. Is that Ethernet? Should we be jumping in now? And uh, yeah. if, if we're talking about the, the next generation, that's all going to be configured via in built in web pages. But that's a straight ah. Ethernet connection. The other different one is the communicator can has the USB connector. So unfortunately, it's a, it's a matter of check which generation of communicator and check which protocol is supported at the bottom. If it's CAN bus, it's USB. If it's first generation blue box communicator, it's an RS-232 cable. And if it's second generation communicator, which is, is just starting to be released now, that will be internal web pages via an Ethernet cable. I think it's probably worth saying as well that we do have um, well, I think we've got very good documentation around this actually on the web. It's quite freely available um, and um, it will it will explain that sort of thing. And, and there's often a lot of help guides. There's videos, there's forums. Um, but generally speaking, there's, there's pretty much all the documentation that you need is just freely available on the website. Thanks. I think um, the normal questions, and we'll 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 carry on from here now.